It's my pleasure to welcome you here today. I'm Beth Strassler, and I'm the cantor, uh, which means the musical worship leader and spiritual leader of the congregation. I'm very proud to be part of this congregation whose board of directors is willing to publicly address the difficult topic of anti-Semitism. We are not, oh, okay. We recently published a special edition newsletter and five of our members who are in college wrote about their uh, fall 2023 experiences after October 7th. If you haven't read it, it's a fantastic read. They're very articulate. It's very good, very well done. Um, you can find it on our website. You just go to the special edition newsletter and there it will be. Thank you to Elise Oliver, Jenny Aranovich, Eva Aranovich, and President David Strassler for seeing that newsletter through to production. And thank you to the authors who so clearly articulated their own experiences. Elise Oliver, Josiah Aranovich, Ariel Bernstein, Elena Hammond, our, and our anonymous writer. The events of October 7th sent shockwaves throughout the world. The country that was created by the United Nations in 1948 to be a safe place for the Jewish people was unexpectedly and brutally attacked. Equally shocking were the dramatic sounds of anti-Semitism that were awakened and expressed after that event. Thank you to everyone who contributed to organizing today. Linda Federman, Jeff Levy, Leah Maycomer, David Strassler, and our tireless IT consultant, Joseph Strassler. <laughs> We're heartened to have such a terrific turnout today because one thing we can do right now is get together and think and learn about anti-Semitism. Thanks for coming, and we hope you'll join us downstairs afterwards for a little reception. If you have not yet met the book, Anti-Semitism Here and Now, by Deborah Lipstadt, it's excellent. Let me introduce it to you now. It's one of the most clearly written books on the topic. Dr. Deborah Lipstadt is the Doro Professor of Modern Jewish History and Holocaust Studies at Emory and one of the foremost Holocaust scholars. She writes the book in the style of letters, people asking her questions about anti-Semitism and her answering their questions. And it's very, very readable, very informative. She's created fictional characters, but they are based on the questions she's gotten from real people over the years. And just to start us out, one of the characters that she's created is Joe, who is a professor in the law school at the same university where she teaches. And one of his first letters is, Dear Deborah, you may be surprised to know that despite all of my writings about prejudice, I've never systematically thought about how to best define anti-Semitism. It would seem that I would be able to define something about which I am so perturbed. I think many of us feel that way today. That's why we're here. Dear Joe, let me reassure you, you need not be the least bit uncomfortable or frustrated by the fact that you can't quite define anti-Semitism. You are hardly alone. Even scholars in the field can't agree on a precise definition, and much of the general public cannot define it either. Finally, Dr. Lipshot writes, actually, it's the first part of the book, but I'm doing it finally. I was surprised by the difficulties I encountered in writing this book, for it was hardly my first foray into addressing painful topics. As horrific as the Holocaust was, it's firmly in the past. When I write about it, I'm writing about what was. Though I remain horrified by what happened, it's history. Contemporary anti-Semitism is not. It's about the present. It is what many people are doing, saying, and facing now. 
That gives the subject an immediacy that no historical act possesses. But it's not just about the present, it's also about the future. Where are these troubling phenomena addressed here, le leading us? We're honored and fortunate to have Dr. Rabbi Dr. David Fox Sandmel here with us today. He's an independent scholar specializing in interreligious interfaith relations. His credentials include past chair of the International Jewish Committee for Interreligious Relations, director of interreligious engagement at the Anti-Defamation League, Crown Ryan Chair of Jewish Studies at the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, and Jewish scholar at the Chicago Institute for Christian and Jewish Studies in Baltimore. He's presently living in Portland, and he's the scholar in residence at the Maine Jewish Museum. He will be a visiting professor at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome this spring. This is the third time that we have welcomed Rabbi Sandmel here. Mm -hmm. The second time he came was just before COVID hit in February 2020. And he did a presentation on anti-Semitism at that time. But the very first time he came here was in August 2012. And he stood up here on the bima. And as the rabbi at the Reform Congregation in Portland, Bet Ha'am, he led the naming for the ceremony for our daughter, Sarah, with guitar, too. So welcome back, Rabbi Senmel. If I can get through this without spilling the water, it will have been a successful event. Now, okay, so we're good here. And I'll, I'll shout out if I need anything, but I'm gonna, um, let's, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. And da, da. there we go, okay. Oh, you're going to move the mic. Yeah, just get a little, little closer. A little closer. Okay. So we'll just do this, okay? There we go. That's good. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, it's wonderful to be here this afternoon with uh, some folks that I have known for a long time um, and also always to meet new people. Uh, it is uh, true that, that I gave a presentation on anti-Semitism here in February of 2020. Um, and uh, I took a look over it in order to prepare for today's presentation, and I think that it's fair to say that the fundamentals have remained the same since then. Um, in that sense, if you happen to have been here four years ago and heard me, uh, some of this is going to be uh, uh, repetitive, okay? Um, October 7th and its aftermath, um, I would argue, did not introduce anything new, but rather simply served to catalyze things that were already there in the culture. Um, and uh, uh, as for, for Deborah uh, Lipstadt, um, in, in terms of defining anti-Semitism, it's uh, very difficult. I'm not going to offer a definition. Uh, we can perhaps circle back to that in Q&A if people are interested in. Let me just say that it's a terrible word. We should get rid of the word and find something different. Um, um, but I'll just leave that out as a teaser uh, for right now. Um, for many of us, October 7th uh, was traumatic and both, both communally and personally, and, and I don't use that word lightly. Um, from the initial horror and shock of the Hamas attack, compounded by the horrendous details that followed, including for some of us at least knowledge that 
people we know or whom we, to whom we are connected in various ways were killed or taken hostage or, or, or both. Uh, even for those without a close connection to a specific victim of October 7th, this feels incredibly personal. And um, I remember there was a meme going around that said, uh, do you have family in Israel? And the answer is yes, seven million of them. So, um, and of course, that attack on the 7th was immediately followed by what can only be described as a paroxysm of anti-Semitism. And that began even before Israel responded. And then Israel responded. And the war with all of its geopolitical complications and players and advocates on all sides has been at the top of everybody's uh, news, uh, news report and everybody's social media feed, uh, at least if you have, the, guess, the same algorithms that I have, maybe, uh, maybe you were spared some of it. Um, and regardless of where one stands on how Israel is responding, if you care about Israel, the ongoing danger from so many fronts the uncertainty about the future, it's all very deeply worrying. And the anti-Semitic, I used paroxysm, now I'll use tsunami, has been nonstop. It's not unreasonable, I think, for Jews to feel overwhelmed and fearful and alone. Now, my focus today is on anti-Semitism after October 7th, and I'm going to focus primarily on the United States. Uh, I'm not going to address the war directly because the details, uh, frankly, are irrelevant uh, 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 to, to my presentation. What the government of Israel does or does not do, how it does or does not um, uh, engage in this war, is certainly a valid con, uh, uh, topic for conversation, for discussion, but it cannot be used an, an, as an excuse or a justification for anti-Semitism, and that's my focus. And I would also say it cannot be used as a justification for anti-Muslim bigotry or anti-Arab bigotry, you know, and we've seen those as well uh, in this country. I'm not going to recite a catalog of the offenses. Uh, I'm sure we've, ah, come back, sit, stay. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm not going to, going to, to, to recite a catalog of the, the offenses. I'm sure we've all been exposed to more than we could possibly need. I want to look a little bit more at the big picture. I'm not here to, uh, provoke outrage or to re-traumatize anyone. Uh, there's already plenty of that going on from all directions. And it's kind of hard to get, wrap our hands around what really is going along, as, uh, what, excuse me, what really is going on, especially if we are focused on whatever the most recent outrage is. That focuses in very narrowly and I want us to step back. Um, I think there was a sense, uh, perhaps a couple decades ago, both among Jews and Christians and others, that anti-Semitism had been relegated to the fringes and was no longer the pressing uh, concern that it might once have been. Um, I think it was either uh, wishful thinking or, or naive to suggest that 2,000 years of anti-Semitism has been uh, expunged a couple of generations after the Shoah, after the Holocaust. Ideas that are this deeply embedded in a culture are almost impossible to eradicate. Certainly, there is much broader recognition and awareness of the reality of anti-Semitism among government officials, community and religious leaders, and others, and their support and their allyship is very important. That has been challenged in the last three or four months. And I think that um, 
uh, many in the Jewish community, at least uh, uh, some of us who are involved in interreligious relations, um, have been uh, disappointed, uh, surprised by the silence, actually, and a sense of, of being alone. Uh, some of you may be aware that a group of Jewish scholars, uh, 400 or so, wrote, uh, signed a letter to Pope Francis basically saying, where are you? Um, and I was one of the ones who signed that letter. Um, and he wrote a response which I thought was quite good. And I just want to quote one line from that response. It says, together with you, we Catholics are very concerned about the terrible increase in attacks against Jews around the world. And here's the sentence that I think is so telling. We had hoped that never again would be a refrain heard by the new generation. Yet now we see that the path ahead requires ever closer collaboration to eradicate these phenomena. And which I think he's saying, boy, we missed it. You know, and we need to redouble our efforts. So what I'm gonna do in the next few moments is delve into the current reality of anti-Semitism in the hope of providing an overview of the trends that we're seeing. <clears throat> okay, now the next technical thing here. Share screen, very good. How does that, is that working? Great, now I just need to be able to see my notes. Okay, is it still good? Um, well, so the, yeah. Uh, okay, I will, I will probably have to use it a little bit. Okay, so, thank you. Um, I want to start by just sharing what are some broad characteristics of anti-Semitism. Um, it's enduring. It's been around for well over 2,000 years. It can be lethal. It arises in different places and times and situations. It is contradictory. Jews are capitalists. Jews are communists. Jews are inferior, but Jews are really, really smart and control the world. Um, it really becomes this sort of one-size-fits-all uh, sort of prejudice. It does uh, share traits with other forms of bigotry, but it also has elements of uniqueness. And by the way, I, I know that I'm standing with the sun right behind me. Uh, whatever is on the screen, I will also be reading. So um, you don't have, don't make yourselves too crazy trying to see that. Uh, it does have elements of, of uniqueness, including uh, the conspiracy theory aspect of it, that, that Jews are basically behind whatever your problem is. It's always possible. And here's what I think is one of the most important things to understand, that it is embedded in the DNA of Western Christian civilization. And here are people, uh, um, uh, Anti-Judaism, the Western Tradition by David Nirenberg. I heartily, uh, heartily recommend that book. While the Christian world inherited some anti-Jewish prejudices from the Greeks and the Romans, they were the ones who crafted the image of Jews as in league with the devil and a malign and dangerous influence. Jews were the antithesis of everything that was good about Jesus and Christianity. And they were therefore a threat to society and needed to be controlled, which was increasingly the case in medieval Europe where Jews were made to wear special clothing, told to live in certain parts of town and so forth. Um, modern Western racial anti-Semitism, of which Nazism is the prime example, inherited and adapted these prejudices. Jews came to be seen as an inferior race that, like vermin, was infesting society and needed to be exterminated. 
These ideas, as I said, are baked into the DNA of Western civilization, which of course is now global, and it's ready to erupt whenever there is a provocation. So um, this is, I don't know if you can see this, the ADL did a study about 14 years ago, a global survey. Again, don't, don't strain yourself, I'm gonna give you all the information you need. Um, uh, they did a global survey. They have, it's, a, it's, it's a poll. They have a series of 11 questions. Uh, you agree or disagree, and if you agree with six of the statements, you're deemed to hold anti-Semitic ideas. And they determined in this survey, and again, it's a survey. It's you know, not Torah from Mount Sinai. It's a survey. But they determined that about one in four people in the world harbor anti-Semitic ideas. Okay? Now, the fact that somebody harbors anti-Semitic ideas doesn't automatically make them a genocidal maniac, okay? You know, people have all kinds of prejudices and it doesn't mean they act on them. In fact, they may act in ways contrary to their prejudices. So, I, you know, I just think we need to be careful uh, about that. But if over a billion people on the planet harbor those ideas. It only takes a very small percentage of those people, and this is one of the things that we have to deal with, it only takes a very small percentage of those people to create problems. Uh, you know, one could draw an analogy to all of the gun owners in the country, right? Only takes a very small fraction of those people, really only one, to create a tragedy. So, you know, we just have to be careful about these kind of uh, numbers. So in terms of what we're seeing broadly in trends, first of all, we've seen over the last, I don't know, decade or so, a re-legitimization of anti-Semitism. What used to be something that was shunned, was generally, um, you know, you didn't want to, you didn't want to own up to that. It's become much more uh, accepted. Uh, we, you know, people are, are happy to say they are anti-Semites. And we see a lot of worldwide issues that are feeding this. And it, it, it goes, you know, it, it, it has to do with a lot of the problems that we see in our world. We can start with the effects of the economic downturn in 2008, which left a lot of people behind. We have the refugee crisis. We have the rise of populist parties. I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. We have the effects of COVID, which, by the way, if you didn't know that it was created by Jews, so the Jews could then <laughs> So the Jews could then invent the vaccine and make a lot of money. This, I mean, it, this is something that was out there, okay? Um, if we uh, take a look at what's happened to our social discourse, especially on social media, uh, which has become just a, oh, I dropped off at Twitter actually shortly after October 7. I couldn't take it anymore. Um, and, you know, look at our political discourse in this country. You know, we don't talk about ideas anymore. All we do is talk about how horrible the other people are. So, and of course, anti-Semitism has been weaponized as part of our uh, discourse. And of course, um, it is no longer only found among what some people would refer to as the triangle consisting of the far left, the far right, and extremist Islam. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, you, we, we see it creeping in everywhere. I mean, I, you know, you think about um, uh, the various uh, 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 personalities who have said anti-Semitic things over the past few years and how it's become such a, you know, I think about Yi, right? Who then had uh, lunch with a certain uh, presidential candidate and so forth. So, you know, this, it's, it, it's, it, we're seeing it moving out of sort of the dark corners and, and, and into, <coughs> excuse me, into more normal discourse. And especially the growing use of anti-Semitism or anti-Semitic rhetoric in anti-Israel rhetoric, okay? And that is clearly one of the things that we've seen so much of since uh, uh, October 7th. And then, as I mentioned, we have the global rise of populism and nationalism, uh, much of which uh, spurs on conspiracy theories related to Jews. Jews control the media, banks, Hollywood, we're engaged in a global conspiracy, 
to eliminate the right white race by promoting things like equality or immigration or fighting racism or promoting feminism. Um, remember uh, from Charlottesville, Jews will not replace us. Uh, uh, Right-wing parties and movements continue to gain political uh, uh, impact and public support, including in this country. I'm concerned about the political, uh, 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 the political climate in our country. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I think about the, what I can only describe as the theater, and now I'm perhaps uh, revealing some personal biases, but the theater of the hearings on Capitol Hill about anti-Semitism on, on college campuses. Anti-Semitism on college campuses is a big deal. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But there was something about the uh, instrumentalization of anti-Semitism in those hearings that made me very uncomfortable. Uh, in Europe, um, the most immediate violent threat to Jews comes from Muslim extremism. In the United States, it's right-wing, white, nationalist, uh, Christian nationalist supremacy that I think is the most dangerous. So now I'm going to throw at you a bunch of um, uh, uh, figures from various research and polling that's been done recently. One of the things, one of the challenges here is that uh, we're only a little bit into 2024, so a lot of the work that's done to collect data from 2023 hasn't been done yet. So some of this is preliminary, and again, I, I'm a little cautious about polls because, you know, what, what is it, lies, damn lies, and statistics? You know, I'm tempted to say lies, damn lies. I mean, polls are helpful, but again, we have to be careful with them. So I'm going to start with the state of anti-Semitism from a uh, excuse me, from a, uh, uh, a study done by the American Jewish Committee. And here are just some of the findings. And some of this, by the way, some of this, uh, the data for this was collected in October and November. So this is pretty fresh stuff. 63% uh, of American Jews say the status of Jews in the U.S. is less secure compared to one year ago. In 2022, it was 41%. In 2021, it was 31%. 78% of Jews who had heard about the Hamas terrorist attacks in Israel say the attacks made them feel less safe as a Jewish person in the United States. And then I'm worrying, thinking about the other 22% of, you know. Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, what I'm thinking about are those who hadn't heard of it, right? But. Um, 46% of American Jews say they altered their behavior out of fear of anti-Semitism. In 2022, this number was 38%. And what does that mean, altered their behavior? Maybe they stopped wearing their yarmulke in public, or stopped going to Jewish communal events, or didn't wear their high, or didn't, you know, these, these sort of things. 85% of American Jews and 84% of the general public believe the statement, Israel has no right to exist, is anti-Semitic. Okay? Um, might take that as a positive indicator. Okay? Um, so those are the key findings. Now I'm going to turn uh, to uh, 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 campus. And I've got uh, a few things on campus here. From the AJC, 24% of current or recent college students say they felt uncomfortable or unsafe at a campus event because they are Jewish. Now that is a disturbing number. Keep in mind that that means that 76% said they had not had that feeling. Okay, again, I'm not, I do not at, in, in any way want to uh, diminish <clears throat> the importance of, of uh, campus anti-Semitism, but I also uh, think we have to be realistic at about who's experiencing it and where and so forth. So it varies a great deal from campus to campus. Read the special newsletter from this congregation. Um, I know that 
There were no issues at Colby College because the faculty there organized discussions and things there went very well. Um, uh, I'm not sure it was the same at other campuses in Maine, but that's one where I happened to know one of the professors, so I was able to ask the question. One in four current or recent college students say they have avoided wearing, carrying, or displaying things that would identify them as Jewish out of fear of anti-Semitism. Okay? And uh, that, you know, that, that one in four, that's about 25%, so that, you know, that, that, that uh, meshes very nicely. Um, okay, online and social media. More than one in five American Jews who experienced anti-Semitism online, 22% experienced anti-Semitism online, reported that the online incidents made them feel physically threatened. I don't know how much time you spend online on any, but uh, uh, it's, it's really astonishing the amount of horrendous hate, not just anti-Semitism, all kinds of hate online. And one of the places where it shows up is gaming. Now, I'm making an assumption here that most of this audience is probably not into gaming, but um, maybe, some of, uh, maybe some people you know. I've been doing some work in high schools around the state, and I ask, uh, you know, have you ever seen this stuff? And get, always get hands up. 62% um, of American Jews reported seeing or hearing anti-Semitism online or on social media in the past 12 months. Okay. All right, shifting things. Where does the American general public stand? 74% of U.S. adults say anti-Semitism is a problem in the United States today, compared to 68% in 2022 and 60% in 2021. So the general population, not just the Jewish population, but the general population is becoming more aware of the problem. 56% of U.S. adults say that anti-Semitism has increased over the past five years. That's U.S. adults, not just Jews. Compared to 47% who said the same in 2022, 44% in 2021. 92% of U.S. adults believe anti-Semitism affects the society as a whole. Everyone is responsible for combating it. So we see two trends here, okay? We certainly see a rise in people feeling and experiencing anti-Semitism. We also see generally that the American public sees this as a problem. I'll take that as a positive right now. So now I'm going to shift to a different study. This is from ADL, Study of Campus Anti-Semitism. And again, this was done after October 7th. Since October 7th, the percentage of Jewish students who said they feel uncomfortable on campus knowing they, uh, with others on campus knowing they are Jewish. Um, I'm, let me reread this. Since October 7th, the percentage of Jewish students who said they feel comfortable with others on campus knowing they are Jewish dropped by nearly half. And a majority of all students, all students, again, not just Jewish students, feel that their campus administration has not done enough to address anti-Jewish prejudice at their universities, with 70% of students saying that their university should do more to address the issue. More than a third of Jewish students said they felt uncomfortable speaking about their views of Israel, and roughly the same proportion said they felt uncomfortable speaking out against anti-Semitism. A plurality of Jewish students do not feel physically safe on campus. Not knowing what to do and concern about potential backlash prevents students from reporting anti-Jewish incidents on campus, but even more so for Jewish students. And while a majority of university students have undergone DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion training, 
Only 18% of those students have received any training about anti-Semitism. Now, I know that DEI work has become quite controversial. Um, I would say that um, uh, 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 fundamentally, I think DEI work is a good thing and a good idea, but it has to be, as the last, as the I stands for, inclusive, right? It has to include, um, uh, 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 it has to include anti-Semitism. Um, I, you know, there are reports that lots of people who who have, you know, um, when they're in DEI sort of workshops and they try to raise the issue of anti-Semitism, they're told that's not relevant, or that they're using their privilege to, um, you know, to derail uh, and so forth. Uh, I, again, I think I think DEI is important if it's done well. Okay, again, uh, just to shift gears a little bit, this is, <clears throat> this is from uh, Pew Center, and um, it's a chart, I know it's a little bit hard to see, but it says more Americans view Jews, mainline Protestants, and Catholics favorably than unfavorably. And if you take a look at the list there, 35% uh, of the respondents view Jews very favorably. And that's actually the highest on uh, the list. And there are other surveys of, um, uh, of, uh, that, that have shown similar things. There, there's uh, something called a feeling thermometer. And you ask people how you feel about different groups and they'll, you know, they put it on. And the Jews always come up in America people feel very good about the Jews. So again, I just make sure that, that we keep some of these uh, uh, things in mind here and go back to, you know, again, if you have a small percentage that is anti-Semitic, it's enough to create problems. And if you have a small percentage of that small percentage who is inclined to violence, that can even cause problems as well. Now, <clears throat> The uh, Anti-Defamation League has, since 1960, been doing a survey of attitudes of Americans. Again, that same 11-question uh, chart, 11-question uh, tool that I mentioned before. And um, if you can see this, beginning in 1960, uh, the numbers were very, very high. They dropped, um, you know, pretty much until just a few years ago when they started going up again. And uh, last year, um, uh, it's a nine point jump from the year before. Now we don't have the figures for 2023 yet, that's from 2022. Could be an anomaly, you know, the way these things work, we have to wait, but you know, because they've been doing the same survey for now over 60 years, people think it's probably a pretty uh, accurate kind of survey. Um, hate incidents in the United States since 10-7. And I put this up, and again, I'm not sure if everybody can see it, but it has data from two different organizations. One is the ADL, which is uh, 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 reporting a 316% rise in anti-Semitic incidents. Uh, the other information comes from CARE, the Council on uh, American um, Islamic Relations, um, and they are also reporting an, in a significant increase of um, at least requests for them to help. Uh, uh, the, the, these, uh, the, the two groups did not use the same methodology, so you can't look at the numbers and compare them there. But again, it's very important for me at least to include in this presentation the fact that it's not only Jews who are being targeted at this point after um, uh, after uh, October 7th. And here is what is, I think, uh, uh, concerning, and this is uh, ADL's audit of anti-Semitic incidents. And this chart begins in 2012 and goes to 2022, and you can see that there is an increase in anti-Semitic incidents and a significant one from 2021 to 2022. Um, I think I can say pretty safely that when the, 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 the data comes out for 2023, we're going to see an even higher 
spike. And of course, what is going on in this country is also going on in Europe as well, um, in South America, in Australia, in South Africa, any place where there are Jewish communities. And this is just a picture of a headline, anti-Semitic acts nearly quadrupled last year in France, says an organization, okay? Um, what's happening in Maine? Uh, this is a, a screenshot of ADL's heat map. And for 2023, again, we don't have 2024 yet, for 2023, we, uh, they have logged 45 incidents. That means people reported 45 incidents to them. 16 anti-Semitic incidents, three anti-LGBT uh, incidents, 20 incidents of white supremacist propaganda, um, and six white supremacist events. No extremist murders, no terrorist plots and attacks, no extremist police shootouts. Um, the, 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 the horrendous attack in Lewiston um, doesn't fit those categories. That's why that's not in here. Um, here's a picture. Um, this is a group called uh, uh, NCS131. I'm sorry, NC NSC131. National Socialist Club, National Socialist, National Socialismus, Nazi, all right? This is a neo-Nazi group standing on the, the steps of the State House in Augusta in August with a sign that says, keep New England white. They were also on the steps of Portland City Hall in April. And, um, uh, I sometimes walk my dog on the East End Trail. Here's some graffiti I found on the wall. I wasn't the only one, but on the wall of the water treatment center there. Um, Jew lies matter. Okay, now when I'm teaching the high school students, I say, what does that sound like to you? And, it, and someone comes in, oh, black lives matter. Right, exactly. The neo-Nazis are equal opportunities haters. They don't just like, don't just dislike Jews, they also dislike people of color, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I don't know if you can see that on one of those, there's the number 1488, 1488. This is neo-Nazi code language. 88, eight is the eighth letter of the alphabet. The eighth letter of the alphabet is H. H, H gives you Heil Hitler. And 14, 14 refers to the 14 words, which is kind of a pledge of allegiance among neo-Nazis and white nationalists. The 14 words are, we must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. All right. And then there's this lovely uh, piece of graffiti, uh, gas Jews with a swastika. Um, this is from Harpswell in the last couple of weeks. And uh, you'll notice, if, if you can see the screen, that actually a man and his son were accused of painting the graffiti. And I always like to see parents and children doing things together. Um, so uh, this is kind of the atmosphere that we find ourselves in right now. And um, it's very, it is very concerning. I want to say a few year words about how one responds to anti-Semitism, sort of communally, not on a sort of direct uh, confrontational kind of thing. But uh, there's, uh, you know, because I've, I've thrown a lot of statistics and we've seen events uh, we, 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 we've seen incidents, we've certainly seen that people, actually, th let me just stop for a minute. Quick show of hands. How many of you all have either witnessed or experienced something anti-Semitic in the last three, four months? Either personally or online, okay, we've got to, you know, we, 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 we see hands going up. All right. Um, how many of you are worried about it? More worried than you were, say, half a year ago, feeling anxious about it? Okay. So, um, 
you know, this is, this is real. This is something that's affecting us here in our community. Um, it is good to see that the general public's becoming more aware of it and to see that most, uh, uh, you know, m most Americans think positively about their Jewish neighbors and even support the existence of the state of Israel. Um, and again, just to keep in mind that what we see is part of a larger phenomenon of hate speech and hate acts and the tribalization of our society. So what do we do? One of the things that we do, especially in the short term, is security. We have to take the threat seriously. You know, no one wants to be in the position of saying, boy, we sure should have gotten a guard for this event. You know, I mean, God forbid, right? Um, we had some conversations uh, between, you know, myself and Etz Chaim about this event. Um, I, I made the joke earlier, I said, you know, if I had been give, doing a presentation on, uh, you, you know, um, theodicy in the Dead Sea Scrolls, first of all, most of you wouldn't be here. <laughs> and secondly, it was probably not the kind of topic that was, you know, going to uh, 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 provoke someone. But, you know, it's talking about anti-Semitism, we have to be careful. And as we said, all it takes is one person, right? And this has become a big deal in the Jewish community and an integral part of running any Jewish institution now. I mean, I remember a few years ago, uh, Janet and I went to high holiday services at Beth Israel in Waterville. And it was the first time they had ever had security, right? Um, but now we know that every Jewish institution has to take security seriously. And that means financial resources and energy, you know, that could be going into other things is now going into security. Security is off-putting. You know, do I want to go through a metal detector every time I go to the synagogue? I don't know. I, you know what I mean? And, and then that makes maybe might, might, might make people feel more afraid and then they won't go. So, you know, on the one hand, it's something we have to deal with. On the other hand, it's a, you know, I, I won't say waste, but it's an uh, unfortunate diversion of, of energy. And it has other negative, uh, uh, negative implications. So whether it's a synagogue or a JCC or a school or an old age home or a camp or a Hillel or a museum or a cemetery, all of these are targets. And if you're identifiable on the street as a Jew, you are a target. Now, again, I, 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 I'm, tr I'm not trying to be alarmist here. And I'm going to say, you know, because I, I hope you've, you know, uh, with the figures and, and, and so forth. Uh, but again, we can't be naive about this. Advocacy and legislation. So, <clears throat> One of the things in this country that we, we have is, is hate crimes. Uh, there is a national hate crime law. Um, um, boy, I'm forgetting the name of it now, but it was named after the, the young gay man who was killed out in Wyoming and a black man, Matthew Shepard, and then there was an African, a black man who was killed. It's named after both of them. But anyway, we have a national uh, hate crime law. The, there is, the states have hate crime laws. They're all over the place. Um, and uh, when we think about hate crime laws, we usually think about the following classes. Race, religion, ethnicity, disability, sexual orientation, gender or gender identity. We also think about laws mandating data collection and even laws about police training. Now, Maine's has a pretty good um, hate crime uh, legislation. Um, it, it covers race, color, religion, sex, ancestry, national origin, physical or mental disability, sexual or orientation, gender identity, or homelessness of the victim or the owner, or, and so forth. Maine doesn't have anything about police training. Okay? So, you know, 
if a police officer hasn't been trained in what is a hate crime, then they don't know how to respond to it, right? So, you know, we have to enact hate crime law. I think there are three, maybe, or four states, that, three that don't have hate crimes. There are many of them that have them, but they don't cover uh, all of the classes. Um, again, training for law enforcement. Uh, data collection is huge. Um, I'm trying to, again, I'm trying to remember the, the number, but um, something like 70 cities over a population of 100,000 last year did not report any hate crimes. Why? Because there's no mandated reporting and there's poor data collection. This is a, you know, you can't deal with the problem unless you can identify it. And then we have to educate communities about hate crimes as well, especially targeted communities, depending on that, what those communities are, especially if they're immigrant communities. They might not even know about the concept of hate crimes. So we have to do that kind of education. And of course, we also have to do education of young people. Um, so um, ADL has a program called No Place for Hate, which does not focus specifically on anti-Semitism, but talks about making, working with schools, with students, with teachers, with parents, and I know they're active here in Maine. Uh, Maine Jewish Museum, got to get that plug in there. Uh, the Maine Jewish Museum has a program called DELET. DELET means door. And um, uh, that's, if you can see that, that's, that's me at Casco Bay High School. Uh, pointing out the same graffiti uh, that, I, that I showed you a couple of minutes ago. Going into schools, we, uh, we've got uh, a grant from the Sam L. Cohen Foundation to go into middle and high schools and teach about Jews, Judaism, anti-Semitism, and, um, and the Holocaust. There's, there, uh, uh, there's mandated Holocaust education in the state, and this is often a, an opportunity. Um, uh, when, when we come to the end of this, you're going to see I, I show you some, some, some slides of happy Jewish people. Um, <laughs> because one of the things that I, that I end with with the kids is let's remember that anti-Semitism is not about Jews, it's about the haters. And that we don't define ourselves by people who hate us. Okay? So I'm going to come back to that in a moment. I also think it's important, though, uh, for us to take a breath, especially when we're triggered. And I, I, I got to tell you, all I have to do is open the newspaper and I'm triggered, okay? But not everything that we hear as anti-Semitic is necessarily intended that way by the speaker. There's a lot of ignorance Okay. There are a lot of buzzwords that are out there right now, slogans. We're using words as weapons. We've heard a lot about settler colonialism, for example. Very problematic term. There's a great article in The Atlantic by uh, uh, Simon Sebag Montefiore, uh, kind of destroying the whole uh, concept of, of settler colonialism. But it's a term that's thrown about, again, especially on college campuses, by people who don't necessarily understand the term and certainly don't understand why it may or may not apply to Israel. I would say the same about the word apartheid. Okay? It's, a, it's, a, it's, it, it's a wonderful club with which to beat somebody, right? And it's a word that has great emotional valence. I mean, apartheid was a horrible, ugly, immoral system. And if I can label you with that system, boy, have I gotten you, right? But then you take people who throw that around and you say, well, let's dig into that a little bit. You know, what does that mean? How does that manifest itself? You know, in some instances, people, again, don't know. Genocide. Another one of the words, right? Easy to throw around, but it has a legal definition. Even from the river to the sea, Palestine must be free. 
You know, there was a, someone did a survey that showed that many of the people who were saying that didn't know which river and didn't know which sea, right? Um, uh, uh, you, you know, um, when someone says, oh, I just think everybody should be free, well, yeah, you know, I, I hope that's what you really think, but what I'm just saying, you know, we, we need to be careful about jumping to conclusions and about judging, because this is such fraught, laden times that, uh, uh, again, just taking a breath and being self-aware I think is very uh, important. Um, and um, I also think we have to recognize that um, there's hateful rhetoric coming from the Jewish community as well. Okay? And uh, so, for example, one of the things that I saw was a chart. And it had a list of all of the Jews who had won Nobel Prize and then all of the Palestinians who had, had, who had won Nobel Prizes. Right? What's the point? Right? Is, 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 are you trying to say that Palestinians are stupid? You know, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I know what the point is, but, but I'm just, I found that offensive. And then there's this. I don't know, again, I don't know if you can see this there. There are two pictures. Both of them uh, feature uh, a young woman with her hair covered, with a keffiyeh around her neck, holding a sign. One of the signs says, you don't get to choose how we resist. The other sign says, you don't get to choose who we rape. Okay? Now, the one that says you don't get to choose who we rape has been altered. And it was altered by someone in the Jewish community, and then it got spread around. Now, we could have an interesting debate about the shades of difference between you don't get to decide who, uh, how we resist and you don't get to decide who we rape, right? I mean, we could discuss that. But the sign didn't say that. And to put that sign out is insightful, and it's a lie, and we can't let that continue either. We have to call that stuff out. Okay? So here's where I come to my pretty pictures. All right, again, if you, if you can't see there, we have two kids and an adult looking at a Torah scroll, and then we have a couple in chairs at a wedding, you know, being held up in chairs. You know, we're not defined by those who hate us. So I've thrown a lot of stuff out here. I haven't been able to address everything, obviously. Um, and if you find this all as depressing and as disheartening as I do, I wanted you to stay with these images, you know, as the final images, not the other images. So I'm going to conclude with trying to answer my title question. Should we be more afraid? And again, I don't know if you can see that T-shirt there, but it has one of my favorite Hebrew expressions on it. We survived Pharaoh, we'll survive this. So, should we be more afraid? Uh, short answer is yes. Objectively, there's more hostility towards Jews and Jewish institutions at, that, at this moment. Um, than there has been in a long time. This is not a surprise. At least it shouldn't be a surprise. Um, the trends have been that in, in, in that direction, and what happened on 10-7 has, has catalyzed and amplified what was already there. There's no telling how long this war is going to go on. Anything could happen at any moment that could fan the flames further. Or people could fan the flames regardless of what happens. And even if the war were to end tomorrow, the question of how quickly and how much this wave of anti-Semitism would subside is anyone's guess, especially as our campaign season ramps up here. I continue to be 
more concerned about right-wing extremists in terms of physical and violence in this country, but I'm also concerned about progressive left-wing anti-Israel anti-Semitism that makes people, especially people on campus, uncomfortable and unwelcome. And I'm very concerned about people being cowed into hiding their Jewishness or disengaging from the life of the community because of fear. So I think we have to be vigilant. I think we have to be prudent. I think we have to take the necessary security precautions despite, despite the costs. We have to advocate. And if we want allies, then we have to be allies. And that's been a little tough lately, right? Um, I know uh, uh, just um, anecdotally from rabbinic colleagues across the country that um, uh, relations with uh, uh, interfaith organizations, uh, relations with Muslim organizations, all of these have suffered of late. I think it's understandable. I think it's unfortunate. I think with careful conversation, it can be overcome. Uh, but it is, it is difficult, but it's also necessary because, again, if we go back to what I consider to be the biggest concern, which is right-wing, far-right-wing nationalist anti-Semitism, again, they're equal opportunity. They don't like Jews, they don't like blacks, they don't like immigrants, they don't like LGBTQ, etc. And if, we're gonna, if we want people to stand up for us, we have to be willing to stand up for them. So that's what I wanted to share with you. Um, I'm more than ready to take some questions. I think Beth is going to... Uh, carry the mic around. I'm going to stop my share. Does that work? Okay. Joe, let's hear it for Joe and the technology. <laughs> um, you can do that. You're the spiritual leader. <laughs> Questions or comments? What do you think would be the best approach um, to address the need for education? Um, I'm really concerned about the younger generation, high school, college age kids, that don't seem to be getting some basic information. And it's not just about anti-Semitism, it's actually pretty much about everything with um, the change in how education seems to be provided these days. I have a lot of issues with that. But how, how can we best educate the younger ones coming forward so that we have a stronger base to work with as these kids grow into adults? Okay, did everybody hear the question? No, okay. So the question was about education. And, you know, especially for young people. What do we, how, what do, we do about education. Um, well, you, you, you think I have the answer to that. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, for example, the fact that Holocaust education is now uh, required in many parts of the country, I think that's a very good start. My concern about Holocaust education is that it's ancient history. For young people, you know. I mean, after all, the pictures are almost all in black and white, right? So, um, uh, so that's one concern: is that it's ancient history. A second concern is that um, uh, again, and I sort of made that point that 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 if you um, uh, if all you learn about the Jews is that they were killed between 1939 and 1945, you're missing something. And so um, 
understanding, you know, some understanding about who the Jews are today, I think is extraordinarily important. And that's why what we're doing through Delit in the schools here in Maine, um, I think is important. We're not really talking about, uh, uh, we, we're, we're not going in and doing the Holocaust lessons. They got that. We're talking a little bit about anti-Semitism, and I've, you know, we've developed these presentations on who are the Jews? No. Um, I talked about DEI work. I think DE, if, if DEI work is done right, that's a place for it. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, and now I'm going to just beyond children, but, you know, I think people have to talk about this. You know, if, 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 if rabbis are talking about uh, anti-immigrant bias and uh, 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 racial bias and LGBTQ bias from their pulpits, it would be wonderful if people in other religious communities would talk about anti-Semitism from their pulpits as well. So, you know, we have to talk about it. We have to talk about it. And that's why... Um, you know, that's part of why I found the, 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 the Senate hearings so disheartening. Um, um, you know, I, I, I think the college presidents um, uh, did a terrible job of responding to the questions. I, I don't know if I, I think, and if anybody saw Dara Horn's article, uh, I also think it was in the Atlantic. Um, she is a Harvard graduate, and I think she may, she was, I don't know if she still is, but on some sort of advisory committee about anti-Semitism. But before the, the, the president went to this hearing, didn't check in with the committee, just checked in with the attorneys. You know, and you could see that, you know, in, in, in some of the responses. Um, uh, you know, the, the um, um, I'm not, okay. I completely lost my train of thought. So, <laughs> uh, 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 we're talking about education, though, and 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 uh, uh, you know, I mean, again, if we're talking about about uh, high schools or middle middle schools, you know, what go, what gets taught at high schools and middle schools varies so much from district to district and you know, state to state. It's really hard to talk about that, um, you know, to, to, but. Uh, again, um, what are the I guess I'd throw it back. What are the opportunities, not only in our schools but in our communities, um, uh, uh, to, you know, to talk about these issues? And what are, what are some like what are unusual places to talk about it? This isn't an unusual place to talk about it, but my understanding is that you went beyond the synagogue community and the Jewish community to invite the general community. That is wonderful. You know, that, that, that's one way to, that's, you know, again, here in Biddeford, Maine, here is one example of, you know, taking a step to, to deal with that. Thank you. First of all, thank you, thank you, thank you for your amazing, thought-provoking conversation or, or discussion that we will have um, as just one of the community of the non-Jewish faith. Uh, this is very thought-provoking and will promote all kinds of discussion. But first, before my question that I will get to, I just want to say about the supposed off-putting nature of having security outside I was an unregistered person who came and said, here you can frisk me or whatever, and he looked at me and just smiled and he said, very graciously, if you don't mind, I'll just look in your purse. And I said, thank you so, so much for keeping us safe. And he said, it is very much my pleasure. So he was as courteous and welcoming as anyone could be. My question is about the graffiti that you saw and took pictures of on public places, are they taken care of? Are they washed off? Do you not feel like carrying around 
spray paint with you just to be able to. <coughs> it was just <coughs> shocking. I, there's so much embedded meaning that most of us are just not aware of that's in that office. Thank you so much. Well, I mean, th this is this is one particular incident of graffiti. Incident of graffiti. Um, there also have been um, leafleting flyers, anti-Semitic flyers. Some of which, you know, those little uh, th th those little libraries that people have on their, you know, little shelf. You can um, people finding these flyers. Uh, if you want to, I can tell you where to go online. You can download these flyers and print them up yourself. You don't even have to create them. Um, as far as removing graffiti, that really depends where it is. Uh, that happens to be a wall that is used by graffiti artists. You know, it's one of the places, and at least one of those artists is someone that is, uh, I know someone who knows one of those graffiti artists who has taken it upon herself whenever that shows up to uh, cover it up with something else. Um, I, I don't, I mean, that's not, I don't know if that's technically public property or not. I mean, that gets it, but, but um, um, I know when I saw those, I took the pictures. Oh, you're, you know, I didn't say this. Report, report, report. Let me say that again. Report, report, report. If you see graffiti, if you see something online, if, I hope it doesn't happen, but if you have a personal experience, uh, you should report it. Um, you can report it to the police. Uh, you can report it online. The Anti-Defamation League has a report a hate incident website. And they, uh, this is part of how they get their data. Um, you know, I used to work for ADL, so when I, I knew this. I, you know, I, I um, got in touch with them right away and I said, you know, do you want me to contact the local police? They said, oh no, we have a good relationship with the police force in, in Portland. So, but report, 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 especially if it may be anything that involves a threat. You know, um, I don't know if that answers you directly. Hello. First, I'd like to say, so I'm the pastor at Union Church at Bitterford Pool, and a number of us are here today to support this community. So I want to say that. And a pastor from Kenny Bunkport is also here, sitting in front of me. <laughs> we just turned around. Um, as you were speaking, and thank you for your remarks, I think we... Our community, when I have reported, when I've been in touch with Beth and she first told me that they had armed security here, and I forget how long ago that was, and I announced that to my church community, and you could feel just this gasp throughout the church. We felt heartsick, and we realized how privileged we were to not be imagining that we had to have armed security at that time. Not that we're not mindful that attacks can happen at all churches. Um, I want to say this, as you were speaking, I was remembering a talk I was at. I worked at Boston College as a chaplain for a decade. And we had someone from the Boston Police Department speak to the student body. This was years ago. He was the head of the hate crimes division. And I will always remember what he talked about, because he used to go out and meet with families who, you know, whether had the cross burned on their front lawn or swastikas painted on the front of their house. And he talked about the trauma that they felt and the people in their communities felt. And he said, we have to look when it starts at that level and step out as a community and say, this is not who we are. This is not acceptable. He said, when it goes unspoken about, when no one steps out and says something, that's where he saw again and again the escalation would happen. And so we all have to have the courage to do that whenever we see it happen, to say, this is not who we are and this is not who we want to be. So thank you so much for being here today, and we'd love to invite you to come speak at our church. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, um, it's, a, a, it's a very good point. There is something, um, a, a teaching tool called the Pyramid of Hate. Uh, if you Google it, you can, you, you can find it. And it, it sort of, you know, it starts with, you know, just ideas and, and, and you know, perhaps jokes and, you know, you go up, 
and eventually you get to genocide, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, no, it's, 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 it, it, it's very important. And, and again, you know, I, you know I, I'm out there walking my dog. I see this stuff. I feel bad. You know, I see the graffiti. I feel badly about it. I'm not too worried about it, except the person who did that, if maybe instead of going down to main hardware and getting a couple of cans of spray paint, maybe they go somewhere and get a gun. And instead of, you know, instead of spray painting, they decide to spray, you know, again, th th this is where, you know, again, I, I, I'm not, you know, especially living here in beautiful Maine, I'm not so concerned on a day-to-day -day basis. I would be more concerned if I was in one, you know, a major metropolitan area, just, you know, for lots of reasons. Um, but it's possible anywhere. And, and... Uh, uh, you know, uh, um, I, I think, you know, it's really, it was really interesting to be in the high school and to show some of the kids these pictures, because they all walk, you know, at least the ones in the air, they all walk down there, right? And uh, uh, I think it was a real shock for them. It was also a shock for them, uh, one of the other things, is said, look, when I go to synagogue on Saturday morning, the door of the synagogue is locked, and there's an armed guard who lets me in. You know, that is sad, but I'm <laughs> thrilled to see them, you know. So, um, uh, and, and again, I, I, I commend you for, for letting your community know about that. I mean, we, you know, we, we need to know what's going on in other communities. Um, uh, you know, because if we don't know, then we can't take action. No. Hi, thank you. Speaking of other communities, I am a member of Beth Israel in Bath, uh, Beth Israel Congregation. And a couple of things. First, regarding the Harpswell incident, for lots of different reasons, I was one of the people that was contacted when that happened. And subsequently, I reported it to the ADL and the local law enforcement, and they did find the perpetrators. Mm -hmm. um, but there was another swastika incident, and there was also a, a swatting incident where the bomb threats were called in. And just this week, sadly, at our town council meeting, they had a public comment period. And for the first hour, it was people talking about how immigrants are ruining our community. Then they went, they opened up the Zoom um, comment line. And in a row, five individuals said the most vile things about Jews, immigrants, blacks, uh, you know, Islamophobia, LGBT, and they pretty much had the floor before the, the chairwoman finally cut them off. But what I find even more disturbing is that since that incident, there was nothing in the newspaper and no statement from the town council. So we have a Kulanu committee at Beth Israel, which is a partnership with the, with the Anti-Defamation League. So we've been drafting a letter hoping that we can get other signatories from other faith communities and organizations to ask the town to you know, repudiate those comments. Um, you know, I think they're concerned about not giving them too much airtime, but, you know, to, to, the silence is really deafening. And, um, but on a positive note, because we have this working group and we've cultivated relationships with our interfaith partners, we're having an event this Wednesday, um, kind of a prayer service. Um, about 75 people have signed up, so, um, you know, we had to bring them along as far as the need for security, but I think everybody gets it now. And um, we also work with the Secure Community Network who advised us as mm -hmm, well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah. you know, that's, <laughs> that's what we're doing to push back. Well, good, good for you. Um, the, the, the broader a coalition you can br bring together to talk to the town council, the more impact you'll have.
think, uh, Beth, I think the, just next to you. Oh, okay. We're, okay. We'll, we'll come back to you, I promise. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I know you've kind of raised the alarm about, <clears throat> sorry, the, the far right. Um, I'm equally concerned about the, the left, the aggressive left. Um, I, I work in a, in a realm, I work in reproductive justice, which is firmly embedded in the progressive left. And all the dog whistles, you know, that you mentioned, like genocide and apartheid and um, white colonizers, et cetera, are all coming from the progressive left. Um, and I think that's making Jews everywhere incredibly unsafe. Um, we might not hear that as much in Maine, but it is for certainly everywhere else, that is, that is the overwhelming threat to Jews. So um, I'm not diminishing that the, the, the right that is hateful and dangerous, but, um, you know, it, for me, at this point, it's, they're equal in terms of how they have targeted Jews and made it unsafe. So I, I think we need to pay attention to that and not diminish that as equally harmful. Um, I also, I know it, when you started, you said you felt like anti-Semitism was not a great term. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, I just use Jew hatred now as, as my terminology because that mm -hmm. is the more descriptive term, I think. Um, and, um, and what I would say, I'm really glad to see a lot of allies here today who are not Jewish, but I do think that it's really critical to not wait for something to happen. You know, to, to be very proactive in your support for the Jewish community. Mm. That's, that's what I need to say. Well, thank you for that. Let, let me just, the, the, the distinction that I draw between far right and far left um, anti-Semitism is prim primarily around the issue of violence. Um, um, uh, it, it, I, um, you know, the, the uh, attack, you know, the, the attacks that have led to deaths in this country, um, overwhelmingly from the far right. Um, uh, you know, and I'm sorry, and you, you mentioned that, that, in, that part of it in Bath was, was uh, anti-Semitism anti and anti-immigrant and all of that kind of stuff. You know, the guy who went into the Etzheim building in Pittsburgh was going in there because the Jews are bringing in the black and brown people into America. It's part of this replacement thing. Um, I think in some ways the left anti-Semitism is perhaps more widespread. Um, and in some ways something that people are going to encounter more on a daily basis. Uh, just because of, you know, like, you know, like, as you said, the people who you encounter uh, you're hearing this from people who you encounter. People on campus are encountering it. You know the the um, uh, uh, you know the 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 NSC 131. You know that was up in Augusta and and, and in Portland. Um, you know uh, people don't run into them all that often, and they're all sort of viewed as a an oddity, I suppose. But. You know, the, uh, again, especially on, on campus, especially in some of the progressive circles where uh, Jews are being made uncomfortable or being told that they're not welcome unless they tow a particular uh, party line. Uh, in some ways, that's probably affecting more people on sort of a daily basis. Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, but, but again, I think the the, the threat of a violence, of a mass event, I think probably comes more from the right than it does from the left. Well, I just want to say one more thing. Um, I think, you know, the temptation now is because of the, the current climate is for Jews to, um, you know, not be visibly Jewish. I'm more visibly Jewish now than I've ever been in my entire life. There, there's lahachas, as we say. In, <laughs> and and you know. as a result of that, I have a sticker on the back of my car which says, "I stand with Israel," which has the Star of David. And last last week, last weekend, not too far from here, right over at the intersection um, 
near Shaw's. My car was targeted. I had a huge drink, uh, coffee drink, uh, hurled at my car. It was all over the side of my car while I was at a light, and then the person sped off, screaming something, I'm sure, you know, anti-Semitic, but I didn't hear it. Um, but that's, you know, that, that can happen. I did think when I got home, good thing he didn't have a gun, you know, but, um, but I'm, I'm still going to be visibly Jewish, and more so than ever. So. Yep. Yep. Well, it's, you know, it's, the, it's the, the refrain from the partisan or lead, right? You know, Mirzain and Daw, we're here. No. Hello. Um, I'm not sure I can phase, phrase this question accurately, but um, as an American Jew growing up in the 50s, 40s, 50s, 60s, with the foundation of the State of Israel, um, and certainly being very pro-Israeli, I'm interested in if you'd address um, anti-Semitism versus anti-Zionism. And, you know, that uncomfortable position now, if we're not politically aligned with Israel's policies, but still very pro-Israeli. And that's my question. Is that okay. Um, so anti-Zionism is another one of those phrases, right? It, you know, um, um, that is used by a lot of people, and I think it's used by a lot of people without a whole lot of understanding. Um, the uh, uh, for many people, I, I, for some people, they uh, uh, believe that, or you know, when they say that they're anti-Zionist, they mean that they um, uh, that they don't. Uh, you know, they disagree with the policies of the state of Israel. Okay? There was a, again, to, just to show you that I spend too much time on, uh, on social media, there was a meme going around with an Israeli woman named Noah Tishbe um, on some campus here, going up to some student who, I don't know, had like an anti-Zionist sign and just talking to him and saying, you know, well, at the, by the way, at the end of the conversation, um, you know, he said, well, so you think that the state of Israel has the right to exist? He says, yeah, I just don't like what Israel's doing. He says, oh, then you're a Zionist. <laughs> you know, um, so, uh, you know, I, I think, first of all, there's that sort of ignorance. Um, uh, secondly, um, uh, you know, Another presentation I could do is what is Zionism, right? So what is, is it religious Zionism? Is it political Zionism? Is it cultural Zionism? Is it Messianist Zionism? Is it Christian Zionism? Which Zionism are you anti, right? Um, if you are Nature Carta, and people are familiar with Nature Carta, it's a, uh, 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 a, a far right conservative Jewish sect which believes that the founding of the state of Israel was an abomination because the state of Israel, uh, that, that the Jews should not return to the land until the Messiah comes. And this was an, so they are absolutely anti-Zionist, okay? They are also way more observant Jewishly than I am, you know. So how do you parse that out? Or if someone is just generally opposed to nationalism of all kinds, right? And Zionism is just another form of nationalism. Well, okay. Um, I thought about doing a slide with this, but I didn't, you know. Um, uh, uh, but I would say practically speaking, uh, not all anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, but a lot of it is, all right? Um, and again, there are, you know, there, 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 there's lots of misunderstandings. For example, this is where you know, the, the idea that uh, Jews somehow came from somewhere else to, the, to this, country, this land to which they had no connection, right? And then the indigenous people were mistreated, okay? Well, um, uh, you know, 
I think many people would argue that the Jews are indigenous to the land of Israel, right? So what we have is not a conflict between colonials and indigenous people, but two people claiming indigeneity in the same uh, uh, piece of, you know, piece of real estate. Um, there are people who don't understand that, uh, you know, don't understand the Jews as a people. You know, one of the things that, again, that, I, that I'm going to, you know, my, my, what my, the course that I'm going to be teaching in Rome in the spring, uh, you know, is, is uh, uh, part of the first lesson is the Jews are not a religious group. Okay? We have a religion that many Jews identify, but there are many other ways to be Jewish, right? Then religion is one of them. I happen to think that religion is, at least for me, you know, it's important, but it's not the foundational definition. So, you know, why does, I don't understand why a religion needs a country. Well, you don't understand the Jews, okay? Um, uh, you know, so there, there, you know, there, there, there are all of these uh, nuances uh, with anti-Zionism. Uh, that is not to say, you know, that uh, the term Zionism has not become a dirty word in some circles. You know, it is. Z you know, Zionism is racism, is apartheid, is settler colonialism. You know, it's part of that discourse. So in, 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 in those, uh, so this is why I say that I think much anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, but again, when someone says I'm anti-Zionist, I think that's where we have to take a breath and investigate a little bit what exactly they mean by that. And this is where, again, especially if we're talking on college campuses where, um, uh, you know, a, 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 a lot of this is, and, and, and this is going to sound sort of much snarkier than I, than I really mean it, but it's kind of, this is, this is the social justice cause of the day, you know. Um, and people jump on and, 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 and again, without necessarily under, understanding it. Uh, doesn't mean there aren't real haters out there. There are. You know, but again, if we, re if, 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 if we allow ourselves to be triggered before investigating, uh, I think we harm ourselves. We miss an opportunity perhaps to educate, you know, um, and, uh, you know, occasionally you can, you can even find someone who says, boy, I wasn't aware of that. I hadn't thought of that before. I'm going to have to think about this some more. That, that can, you know, in some settings, that can happen, right? Obviously, there are settings where it can't happen. Did, did I address that at all for you? Especially, I'm part of an interfaith family to defend Israel. What a, and, you know, in my heart, it's, that's what it is. It's always going to be right, but yet, you know, it's that conflict between their politics aren't always right. So, yeah. I don't know, maybe just speaking a little to the discomfort. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the, I, I think, and, and again, I, I'm not sure if this is exactly where you're going, but, but, um, uh, you know, the, somehow the, the idea that um, I can't be both um, sympathetic to is Israelis and sympathetic to Palestinians at the same time, why not? You know, um, or that I can support the existence of the Jewish state even if I don't support the specific policies of the current government, you know. Uh, I, you know, I think one of the other casualties uh, has been nuance here. Um, you know, so, um, and in, you know, by the way, and in the Jewish community. You know, I mean, even among, our, even among ourselves, you know. Um, uh, so, um, you, you know, the, the uh, I'm very concerned about what's happening to the Palestinians in Gaza. I don't know, I simply don't know 
whether the tactics that Israel is using is the, are the right tax or tactics or the wrong tactics. You know, I, I, you know, I'm not sitting in that cabinet with, with, with all those people and I, you know, I'm not an Israeli citizen and I'm not a military person and I don't know international law. Um, I'm concerned about the existence of the state. I'm concerned about my friends and family. And I should be able to be concerned about them without having to defend every decision of the state. I mean, you know, if I were to say, I'm an American citizen, but I don't necessarily agree with everything this country does, you know. Uh, so, you know, I, I mean, this is one of the things I love to say. Look, Israel's the only country in the world that discriminates between Jews rather than just against them. <laughs> right? So, um, uh, you, you know, um, uh, it, it, it is a uh, modern national nation, a modern secular nation state um, made up of a diverse population of people from all over the world with all kinds of views. Um, some people say that the Jews are like all other peoples, even, even only more so, you know. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, I mean, Israel, um, um, there's a book that came out a, a number of years ago called If a Place Could Make You Cry. Um, uh, you know, I mean, Israel makes me crazy, <laughs> right? I love it. I don't love everything it does, but it makes me crazy. So, um, uh, but I'll tell you that on October 7th, I was destroyed, you know. And I think that, you know, I think that's, a, that's, another, that's another piece of it is, is, is that I think one of the disconnects that, that, that some of us had, um, uh, and again, this is, a, it, it, is that some of my colleagues in the interfaith world were reacting rationally and I wasn't ready for rational. I was trying to find the strength to say I want those little redhead babies home. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you want me to say it again? I was trying to pull myself together to say I want those little red-headed babies home. You know, so how you move from that to let's have a discussion about the history of the land of Israel, for, you know. Oh. Thank you. I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Oh. Testing one, two, three. You just really have to speak up. Thank you for uh, sharing one comment and then one question. Um, one comment I have is uh, about the media. I was pretty uh, pleased to see during Hanukkah, this is in Maine, the coverage for Hanukkah, and it really gave me an opportunity to share with other people about the miracles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I was happy to see that. The question I have is, can you share uh, with us, um, <clears throat> I'm very concerned about the younger generation. Um, growing up in Maine and stuff, um, we had people that were connected to World War II, that served, and that had a family connection some, in some way, maybe. But the younger generation, like you said, seems to be disconnected. Could you, so could you share on an overview what you're doing in education and then who the contact persons would be that would be beneficial, whether it's on a regional level, to get that into the area? Sure. Thank you. Well, um, you know, again, what, what, we're, what we're doing is um, uh, uh, we are, uh, first of all, trying to get the word out to, to, to schools that, that we're available. Um, and again, we focus on a few things. Uh, um, uh, we, we, we primarily focus on um, who are the Jewish people uh, and along with that, Jews in Maine. So we want to try to bring it home. You know, this isn't something that's happening in you know New York or Los, you know it's not not something happening, but you know there are Jews right here in your community, right? So that's 
And, and so that's a piece of it. And, and anti-Semitism, talking about anti-Semitism is, the, is uh, the other piece of it. Uh, the project is called the Delit Project. It's run through the Maine Jewish Museum. In fact, there's a landing page now on the, uh, on the MJM website. Um, and, uh, you know, we need, to, we, we need to be invited in by the schools. Um, uh, but, you know, we've got, uh, 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 when we went to, um, when we went to Casco Bay, we actually had a lot of time with the students and we were able to bring with us one of our, uh, uh, one of the people involved in the board who, who is a child of Holocaust survivors, who was able to talk about his experience. Uh, obviously, the, the ability to have survivors uh, come and speak is, is quickly dwindling, right? Um, um, uh, I have to say that we've gotten some really positive feedback uh, from the teachers and the schools uh, about this, and I think you know we're hoping it's it's um, uh, we can go to the schools or the schools can come to the museum, and in fact we even have some funds available to help with transportation. Um, uh, I don't know if you're involved with schools, but anything that 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 involves a field trip these days is a nightmare for the schools. You know, not only arranging the transportation, but permissions, you know, everything. But we're trying to make ourselves um, uh, 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 available. And I, you know, I think that, that um, one of the, uh, uh, Robert Putnam wrote a, Put, I always, I, Putnam or Putman, I always uh, uh, reverse those two letters. But he, the guy who wrote Bowling Alone also wrote a book called American Grace. And in American Grace, he talks about some of the changes in American society over the past couple of generations. And one of the things he talks about is how diversity is coming into people's families, right? And when Thanksgiving dinner, Aunt Sue made the best sweet potato casserole, and Aunt Sue happens to be a member of some group that is not part of the family. Right? That sort of personal contact has made a huge difference. If we think about uh, gay rights and gay marriage, right? People knowing people, personalizing it, makes a big difference. And so again, I think, um, you know, I wish when I was going into these schools that I was like 40 years younger, I would probably be much more credible, or 50 years younger even. <laughs> um, but, y you know, uh, for, uh, uh, especially when we go to, into uh, some of the schools that are not like right in Portland, which is a pretty diverse place, but when we go, you know, I'm sure that for some of these people, uh, uh, we go in with, with, with Don LaRochelle, who's the uh, director of the museum, we're the first Jews they've met, right? But that makes a huge difference. You know, that puts a, 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 a you know, a face and, and, and an experience and so forth. So. Um, again, I think I, I wandered around a little bit in response. Was that close enough? Okay. I think our time is pretty much up. Uh, um, I just want you to thank everyone for coming. Uh, I think I speak for everyone here of our congregation that we're really heartened to see such support. And thank you for bringing it today. Let's let it be a beginning, and let's continue. And you have the right to nudge us or anyone else into, why aren't you doing this, or why aren't you doing that, if you feel like it would be helpful to the community. Please do. David, unbelievably wonderful today. Thank you so much. And it's, and it's nice to be back at Ed's Chaim in Biddeford. And we arranged for the light Above there, there. to shine on you. There, 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 I don't normally have a halo. <laughs> Today you did. There you go. So please join us downstairs and thanks again.